So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to seminar six in our water quality improvement plan review seminar series. My name is Maria Rosier, and I'm working with the team to review the water quality improvement plan. These seminars are part of our listening phase where we're trying to provide um, valuable information for those wanting to engage in the process. Um, and hopefully you'll find them as informative as we do. Um, today we have amazing speakers. We have Melissa Lane, Kay Walker and Jenny Skerritt from um, Melissa and Kay are from the Reef Authority and Jenny is from CSIRO. And if you were here last seminar, if you get a chance to attend, uh, to watch it, we last seminar we spoke about the water quality targets and how they're ecologically relevant for that marine environment and seagrass and coral. So today we're gonna get, take a dip into the ocean side and talk about um, how um, the Reef Authority monitors and reports on um, in an integrated way around the knowledge that we capture, our international leading marine monitoring program, and then the e-reefs modeling that CSIRO run. So before I kick off to our presenters, I will um, do an acknowledgement of country. I, I am on Niagara and Turbo country in the engine. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present. I'd also like to extend that acknowledgement to all the traditional owners of the reef and um, acknowledging that land to sea connection and caring for country um, over 65,000 years. If you're a First Nations person on the line today, I'd also like to extend my acknowledgement to um, your elders, your country and your culture. And with that, I'll pass us on to Melissa. Thanks, Maria. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'd just like to also acknowledge uh, the traditional owners on the lands on which I'm presenting to you from today, which is the Wulgarukaba and Bindal people. I'm going to be talking to you today about the Reef 2050 Integrated Monitoring and Reporting Program. It's a bit of a mouthful, so I'm just going to refer to it as RIMREP. RIMREP is a key foundational component of the Reef 2050 Long-Term Sustainability Plan, which provides an overarching framework for managing and protecting the Great Barrier Reef. RIMREP's primary purpose is to drive resilient space management and track progress against the objectives and goals outlined in the Reef 2050 Plan. RIMREP is founded on a strong partnership model which involves traditional owners in the program's governance and um, a collaboration between program partners which involves Australian and Queensland environmental science agencies. The uh, purpose of the program is to use the best available science and knowledge to guide management actions to improve reef health, recovery and resilience. It has encouraged innovation in monitoring and supports the evolution of digital systems and tools that focus on users' needs and are useful in reef management. RIMREP's scope of works spans a range of activities focused on the collection of data, access to that data, and tools that help people use data to guide reef management. RIMREP is seeking to answer the following questions. Who is doing what on the reef? How can we do monitoring together better in an integrated and coordinated way? And how can we deal with big volumes of data so that it can be synthesized for reporting on the current state and trend of the reef? Each annual business plan for RIMREP lays out a series of projects designed to progress the program in alignment with its five-year business strategy. These projects are led by various RIMREP partners. RIMREP is interested in integrating, coordinating, synthesizing, making accessible and transforming data that others might be collecting into knowledge for management purposes. The RIMREP Data Management System, or the DMS, is our central repository for RIMREP data. It provides a purpose-built catalog and repository in the cloud. The DMS has been created to enable 
sorry, I'm going to go back. Thank you. The DMS has been created to enable timely access and spatially explicit information for reef managers, reef users, traditional owner communities, and the general public. This access point is designed to streamline our data analytics and digital production development in house, providing a robust platform where we can easily break down information silos across agencies and partners. The DMS will eventually be accessible with appropriate regulations for all users, and it will grow according to users and RIMREP needs. The Reef Knowledge System is the online access point for RIMREP, providing a location that provides inset, insights and directs users to reef monitoring information from multiple sources. The team advancing the reef knowledge system are constructing a range of analytical dashboards to support reef 2050 reporting. Along with other core monitoring programs, the Marine Monitoring Program is the international leading monitoring program that contributes data to the DMS. The seagrass dashboard shown left on your screen provides a synopsis of seagrass research and data from the Marine Monitoring Program that provides current information on specific seagrass sites. This information is used in resilience-based management decision-making processes, such as the determination of intervention activities based on risks and cost effectiveness, the spatial prioritization of recovery monitoring post impacts, permit application review processes, and the development of climate impact resilience strategies. On the right of your screen, the Resilient Reefs Network Guidance Tool provides a synopsis of cumulative impacts for the reef, specifically reporting on the coral objective in the Reef 2050 plan. This dashboard is not yet live, but it will enable the identification of priorities for future plans of management in the marine park. Data analysts are looking at ways to better utilize the data collected through the Eye on the Reef program and other data sets that are being made available through the data management system. Here is an example of a dashboard that has been drafted for seabirds to enable reporting on the seabirds objective in the Reef 2050 plan. We're going to take a listen to one of the team members discuss how it can be used. Next slide, please, Emma. Thank you. So the following slides are going to showcase some um, other dashboard examples that utilize sightings data from the Eye on the Reef app. So here we have shark sightings based on species ID, location and temporal scales. And some more examples, we've got um, similar dashboards for crocodiles and jellyfish sightings, again, based on species ID, their location and temporal scales. The Reef Authority's Crown of Thorns Starfish Control Program dashboard is used to coordinate timely responses to outbreaks through collaborative efforts involving program partners. This program is aimed at protecting coral on high value reefs by suppressing starfish numbers to sustainable levels for coral growth and recovery through strategically targeted manual culling. The Crown of Thorns Starfish Strategic Management Framework outlines the targets from the Reef 2050 plan. Survey data is collected through the Australian Institute of Marine Science Long-Term Monitoring Program and the Reef Joint Field Management Program. This data is then used to inform culling activity across spatial scales. For more information about this program or to look through the dashboard, please visit the Reef Authority website. So I've taken you through a few examples of some of the dashboards that have been developed to guide management actions to improve reef health, recovery and resilience. 
Our program partners are working collaboratively to ensure the continued integration of data and knowledge about the reef and provide guidance on the design of decision support tools to help users with their decision making processes. The reef knowledge system is currently being reimagined and will be the first stop shop for evidence based data and information for the reef. So thank you. I know that was a really brief run through of RIMREP, but we're going to be hearing from Kay now um, a little bit more about the Marine Monitoring Program. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Melissa and Maria and team for the opportunity to present the MMP today. Um, as Melissa said, the MMP, oh sorry, the Marine Monitoring Program, we refer to it as MMP is short. The MMP is a core program of, of RIMREP and I'm here today to talk to how we monitor the, the Great Barrier Reef or the reef as we refer to it now and what we do with the data as part of addressing and managing the interconnected reef ecosystems in an integrated approach which includes the vital intersect between monitoring and modelling, but more of that later. So hi everyone, I'm Kay Walker. I lead the Marine Monitoring Program from within the Reef Authority. Uh, you'll find in a moment we have lots of partners that we work with. I also sit as the Water Quality Advisor for the Reef Authority um, and sit on numerous working groups, uh, including the Wetland Governance, the Reef Wetland Governance Group. Thank you. Next slide. So as the leading agency for the MMP, we partner with a number of agencies who actually do all the hard work, right? So the Australian Institute of Marine Science, JCU's TROP Water Team and Cape York Water, um, Water Partnership. And they monitor coral and seagrass health in relation to monitoring water quality condition in the inshore region throughout the year, every year. So a bit more in a moment about what we mean by the inshore region and what's in there. But this program, just a, a couple of points about the MMP, it's now been collecting continued data for both seagrass, sea coral and water quality, and in some cases for even longer than 18 years. So this is considered to be the longest continually operating tropical marine water quality program in the world. Um, and the fact that it's empirically based with regards to its methodology and it's continually reviewed by independent, ex uh, independent external experts, it's considered to be an internationally leading program as was alluded to previously. The data collected is highly regarded for its robustness and a range of parameters that is corrected and often we refer to these as indicators, we'll have a look at those in the moment, um, and for providing current information about the health of these habitats in relation to water quality conditions and the trends that we can now start identifying reef wide, particularly, for example, the recovery process following impacts and events such as cyclone disturbances and floods. So the question is, where does the data go and what is done with it? Next slide, please. So the MMP is the reef component of the Paddock to Reef Integrated Monitoring, Modelling and Reporting Program. And for those that aren't familiar, this sits within the Water Quality Improvement Plan and it focuses on improving agricultural practices to improve water quality that is actually entering the reef from the catchment areas. Um, all of the data that is collected and is the results are transferred into indicators for the parameters we'll have a look at, are reported to the Reef Water Quality Report Card as part of this interagency relationship. They get reported as scores and in the report card they're reported as grades, they're converted to grades. It's also the data that goes to, and that's the what that's the seagrass and coral data that goes straight to the report card, but the water quality data that is collected goes to CSIRO's ERES, and we'll hear more about that a bit later, and they can incorporate that with other modelling um, forces such as the hydrological and river load data, etc., and then that comes back to the reef report card as a, as a modelled um, grades for the water quality of the reef. So, all of our data is made available to anyone for all access and it's provided to the NRMs, particularly in our regional groups for their analysis and reporting purposes. Um, and the reason I've included to this um, map on the left, we can see 
from the size and the scope and the scale that we're talking here, these catchment areas depicted um, that enter the reef, you know, the reason this is considered to be such a world leading program is that often the reef is compared and it's about 344,000 square kilometres. It's often compared with the size of Italy, right? Well, the catchment area draining into that reef is even larger. So it's about 400 and something thousand square kilometres. Don't ask me the exact details. But the scale is immense. We have a coastline that, you know, is over 2000 kilometres that we're trying to cover all the way up and down. So it's uh, the MMP is uh, um, an independently author reef authority funded program and it does contribute as part of RIMREP as we discussed, but it has a lot of interagencies, uh, interagency connections as well and responsibilities and obligations. Um, but let's just have a look first perhaps at what part of the reef we're really talking about. If we look at that map on the right, <laughs> left, you're a bit quick, but that didn't matter. We can go there. I was about to say, if you looked at the map in the previous one, I was going to say, what do we notice about how the inshore region is depicted? Have a look at this slide here. And we've got two different depictions of how the inshore is represented when we talk about the reef. And it's an interesting concept because we used to always say the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. Now we've referred to it as the reef and I'm always interested is if this has changed people's perceptions of what exactly we're talking about. So in the map on the left you can see that probably the open coastal area would be referred to as the inshore area and little table below kind of gives you the distances from the coast that this occurs in. But what detail can we see in there of what is in actually? What are the habitats that are actually there? Let's look at the right hand map. And we can see here that the inshore reef is actually depicted as a stable blue line running just along the coast all the way through the map. And yet again, do we see any detail of what is actually, what are the habitats or ecosystems in the inshore area? What we really see is the platform reefs depicted from the mid to outer shelf. So if we hit the click button again for me, thank you, M. Um, I believe when, if I said to you, and we'll just stop there for a moment, if I said to you, where is the reef, what is the reef, what is the image that would first come to your mind? And perhaps it's the image that you see here, which is a <clears throat> classic mid-shelf mid reef, it's hook reef heading out to the, the deep or blue water, and these are referred to as the platform reefs. And so often I hear from people that, you know, water quality is not an issue because it doesn't reach these reefs. Well, let's have a look at that because the inshore plays a very important role in managing the water quality that enters the reef and actually helping to filter that and stabilise it and prevent the sediment and nutrients from going any further. If I asked you to think a bit harder, what would we see in the inshore? Click please, Emma followed by the next one. These images of the reef where our iconic species such as dugong and turtle, many of our recreational and commercial fish species, our prawns are completely reliant upon and often predominantly found. And on the right, the picture of a of a, an inshore island, we have around about mm, 600 continental islands in the entire reef space most of these are in the inshore area and all of them are surrounded by fringing coral reefs of some sort. So this region is where the Queensland community really spends most of its time. It's also where tourists actually spend most of their time as well. Um, I asked just as an example because I think some people I'm not sure about how valuable or what is in this inshore area and why we're looking to protect it so much and why it's so important. So I last asked a colleague of mine, we both live on Magnetic Island just off Townsville, and asked him to just give me a collate, you know, a collate a series of photos that he took just in one day, um, scooping around his favourite spots in the island and taking photos while he was snorkeling. And these are the images he sent me. If you want to just hit the one click. It's not bad, huh? And that wasn't even a really great viz day. 
It's beautiful, it's prolific, it's valuable, it's a great place to visit. And I think it's too often overlooked um, because we're always focused on those outside reefs. The inshore reef is in fact an incredible tapestry and even just around the island I live on, I can see it. An incredible tapestry of seagrass meadows, which we've got about nearly 50% of Australia's seagrass meadows all exist in the World Heritage World Heritage Area, the Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Area. And it's a tapestry of these interconnecting with the coral reefs, both fringing and coastal, as well as lots of other types of habitats, sand and rubble and um, algal areas and um, um, sponge gardens and all sorts of things. So there's a lot in this area that we actually do not ever really see depicted in the maps. Thanks, Emma. So how else is the MMP data used? And um, Melissa mentioned this, through innovative techniques and um, calculations and algorithms, we actually start looking at how we can start identifying the resilience of these ecosystems. And resilience is, and I don't think we defined it before, it's the capacity of a habitat or an ecosystem to not only withstand negative impacts and disturbances, but also to recover from these disturbances. And it's used to, another Another definition would be the capacity of an ecosystem to return to the pre-disturbed state after a big disturbance. Now, we may never be able to achieve pre-disturbed states, but we certainly, and we're not sure, heading into a climate change world, but we certainly won't know what they are if we haven't been monitoring. So monitoring not only tells us what's there and the health, but it also tells us if we need to have a moment where we think about intervention strategies to help support the resilience of the reef. And we talked about the seagrass here, and I like this photo a lot because it shows that intersect between seagrass and coral reefs, and they're often intersecting, particularly in the inshore area. Seagrass not only acts as filters to nutrients entering the reef, but also helps to stabilise the sediments and sands that where they exist to prevent sediment from being re-disturbed when we have storms and etc. So next one, thank you. How do we identify the resilience of this critical habitat? Well, our seagrass researchers have taken the data and they don't just send us, you know, convert that into indicators of different types of um, health indicators such as reproduction or density, et cetera, but they've actually made an algorithm now to put in a decision-making tree about helping managers to decide what is the resilience of this seagrass meadow where is intervention worth um, investing in, in the sense, what would be the success and when may we be thinking about doing that? And I think that's also something that Melissa talked about. So we'll move on, thanks, Emma. This is a conceptual diagram that we put together for the MMP when we talk about it. Helps me sort of show not only how busy the inshore area is, um, I think, I think on the latest information I had, and I'm sure that's old information, we had about 164,000 boat owners in the Great Barrier Reef region. And you can see here that this is where they spend most of the time. In fact, a friend of mine actually refers to the inshore region as far as you can go in a small tinny. That's how they describe the inshore region. But you can see here that all the activity is here. We're having ships intersecting with whales. We have ships coming in and out of ports, we have jet skis, boats, we have everything happening here. In fact, I've always asked for them to move that jet ski a little bit away from the dugong that it seems to be heading towards, but the graphic artist hasn't changed that yet. So what we have is this interconnecting e ecosystem of not only reefs and seagrass, but also the wetland areas, as you can see here. And amongst all those um, continental islands that we have near the coast, we also have over a hundred mangrove islands that actually exist in the marine park as well. Um, so here is the MMP. This is a, the way we uh, depict how it's collecting data and what it's collecting. You can see that, for example, coral, and we hear a lot about coral cover, but that really is only one indicator of coral, in fact, we couldn't even say coral resilience. Coral cover on its own does not give us any sort of indication about coral resilience. You have to look at other parameters of the health of coral and coral reefs. So in this um, monitoring program, we look at coral cover, 
cover change, the macro algal cover, which is incredibly important in shore reefs, juvenile coral um, density, and the coral community itself, what the makeup of that community is. And the reason that the macro algal cover is so important is that when we're talking resilience and there's a big impact and the reefs and the corals have been disturbed and they have either um, been broken or covered in sediment from a big flood, flood event, water quality really becomes important in their recovery because macroalgae loves nutrients. And so the more nutrients that are coming out of the river system, the quicker they will take over those spaces that the corals are no longer inhabiting and grow. And then once they've grown, they overshadow the corals and they have no, they have very limited competition chance then accessing light to actually survive. So it's a really, really important dynamic that is very, very reliant on water quality and something similar in stories that we see in seagrass. Um, but one of the things that seagrass does is it stabilizes the, the sediment, um, not only filtering, but stabilizes and prevents erosion. So once erosion occurs and there's nothing growing there, that sediment and those nutrients associated are continually resuspended. So you can see here we sort of have the shadow of the, the water quality boats coming out and you can see the changes in the water colour. We're looking at turbidity, chlorophyll, nutrients, temperature, salinity, secchi depth, which is basically vis, as well as pesticides. And in seagrass, we've talked about that. We look at abundance, composition, reproductive status. Next slide. The other thing that we um, I use this for, as I said before, is trying to make all the interconnecting relationships apparent and how these work together um, and how also this inshore area works both ways of protection. It protects those reefs further out by the stabilisation and the filtering of nutrients and sediments, but it also protects our coastlines from erosion. So if there were no reefs and no seagrass beds, they were left to erode or um, be affected and they didn't recover from, say, cyclone impacts or whatever, we wouldn't know exactly what would happen to the stability of our own coastline. So I suspect that little lovely little, uh, you know, place there where all the boats are pulled up, the marinas of the world would start having a problem along the coastline. Um, next click, thank you. One of the other things that the marine monitoring program does, and I'm really proud of this, and of course I don't do it. You know, JCU team prepares every year for a wet season and potential flood impacts. They look at the predictions, they, they get ready, they have all their equipment ready, and they reactively go out and monitor as soon after a flood event, even it, while the flood event is still occurring as they possibly can. And one of the reasons they do this is not only are we interested in potentially the nutrients, et cetera, coming out and the sediment plume, but what exposure, how much of the reef and the habitats associated that are exposed to this increased sediment and nutrients. And you can see this one was from 2022, it's up north. Um, We've got, I'm looking very closely around, north of the um, Endeavour and Annan River area, and you can see the plume in the right-hand photo. The left hand is pre-plume. The right-hand photo you can see here, satellite image that is, is, the plume has extended right out through to Forrester and Snapper Reefs, and this is this is substantially out into the middle mid-shelf area. So we're out to platform reefs now, and Jenny will talk a little bit uh, later about the resuspension aspects of these. Um, Next click. So the final aspect I wanted to talk about is the pesticide analysis for the inshore area because there's some controversy about that and whether that is um, necessary or not. Um, one of the things about it is that new, the pesticides, we focus in the monitoring program on the high or critical high risk areas, but pesticides they will often say, and when I first came to this position two years ago, they said, oh, they're such minute amounts, it's not an issue, okay? The problem with that is that when you're monitoring, you only monitor at a specific time, right? You're not out there doing a continual monitoring 
of pesticides exiting. So we actually monitor at specific times and specific locations. And it's not just the individual pesticide, and this is the whole aspect of resilience management. It's the cumulative impact that occurs. So not only do you have one pesticide, you have a series of pesticides and you have to look at them together. So not just one indicator, but all of those indicators together along with what else is happening at the same time. Is there been, if, if the levels of pesticides are found to be higher, it's most often associated with the first flooding of the season. Um, and that will be when everything is flushed out. And that is something to be concerned about because the intense impact is different to a long-term low level impact as well. And these are the things we're still trying to work out. Um, and next slide, thank you. With the help of CSIRO and their eRES program, thank you very much, Jenny, who's about to talk, they are helping us know where to monitor, what needs to be monitored as they model these processes of where the water flows coming out of the rivers. And also now they're layering that on top of, say, the seagrass beds. So we can start seeing risk exposure of those critical habitats. So pretty exciting stuff. Great to be working with the team and thank you for your attention. I'll hand over to Jenny. Um, uh, hi, I'm Jenny Skerritt from CSIRO um, Environment and I'm talking on Muanina country, Napaluna Hobart, Lutrawita, Tasmania. And I'm going to be talking about the eReefs platform which is highly involved and integrated in with the monitoring program and the GBR and the Paddock to Reef program. Um, so in this animation, you can see the Ear Reefs Marine model with rivers flowing into the coastal environment. The red is freshwater from the rivers and you can see the rivers flow out and primarily north rather than horizontally or directly out to the east. Um, with the help of wind and ocean currents, some of the river plumes can also make its way south by the east um, Australian current, which you can see is further out on the reef where it goes from north to south. Um, the pulsing action you can see is due to the inclusion of tides and waves in the model. Um, you can think of this model like a meteorological or weather model, except it's in the water, so it's three dimensional and all parts of the model are representing the environment, how it occurs at every given 10 minutes for the period of 2010 to 2023 in a three dimensional space. Um, you can see the rivers don't stick to their land catchment boundaries or the NRM regions and all of the northern regions often have an influence from the rivers from the south. Um, to give you an idea of the extent of the, um, the northern extent of the rivers in years of high rainfall such as 2011 during Cyclone Yassi, 1% of the Fitzroy River ended up 1300 kilometres to the north in Princess Charlotte Bay. So I just want to emphasise from the start that close to coast can be heavily influenced not by the closest river, not only by the closest river, but often by many rivers to the south. Um, and this can lead to accumulation effects along the coast, um, such as um, Kay's uh, sort of referred to in her talk, um, which has, you know, close to the coast areas, which is areas such as seagrass and coastal nearshore reefs. Um, and these are as ecologically important as the main reef body to the east. Uh, next slide. Thanks, Anne. So E-Reefs was developed to assess uh, Great Barrier Reef environmental conditions, both past and present. We run the model from 2010 to 2023 at the moment. The research components integrates observations and model from the catchment to the marine domain and from the atmosphere as well. Um, we provide freely accessible data products, um, um, a comprehensive information platform that is publicly accessible through the data portals. Um, and through AIMS portals, as well as the ARIS portal, uh, visualisation and web services. And if you really want, the entire model is also available for you to run um, um, if, you, if you ever want to go that far. Um, the platform also includes management options to mitigate the risks associated with multiple and sometimes competing uses of the GBR, um, as well as um, the marine models used for reporting and decision support tools. Next slide, thanks, Sarah. So I'll be returning to sections of the slide in the talk um, just in 
reference to what the model does, I mainly want to show the main features in the green and red boxes. So the green is all the modelling and observational side of the marine model and the red is the data and management products. So in the, on the left-hand side in green, you can see forcings. Um, so in a marine model, forcings are at the edges and inside the model. So boundary forcings on the edge of the model set the external conditions that are going on inside the model, while internal forcings uh, distribute these influences throughout the model and they drive interactions between the physical and the biological processes that are actually contained in the marine model. So we have in the marine model, we have wind forcing, which affects the surface of the ocean and creates waves and currents. Uh, we have heat forcing where the sun heats up the ocean surface and affects the water temperature and therefore the circulation. Uh, atmospheric forcing, as I said, the model is three-dimensional and includes things like atmospheric pressure and rain. So we have the atmosphere involved in the model as well. Freshwater forcing, um, inputs of fresh water from sources like rivers and rain. And this affects the salinity and the water density. And because rivers are fresh, our fresh water floats on top of the um, marine um, saline water and, and until it gets distributed by the ocean and currents by advection and movement of this water. Um, as I said, we have tidal forcing and nutrient forcing, and this is pr uh, probably the one I want to emphasise most. We have inputs of nutrients from rivers, such as nitrate, phosphate, pesticides and sediment, and these come from the paddock um, to reef um, catchment and, and um, paddock and catchment models. Um, in the middle green boxes, we have remote sensing. And one of the ways we use remote sensing observations in integrating them into the model run in what's called a reanalysis or data assimilation. And this is actually state of the art internationally where the model learns from the observation and corrects itself. And this isn't machine learning, uh, which is sort of more statistically based or pattern based. Um, DA sort of changes the maths on the fly, so to speak, to improve um, to improve the model output for um, things like chlorophyll and TSS. Um, and of course, uh, down the bottom, we have we use many observations, both for the biological model and the physical model and the chemical properties within the model. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is um, all the rivers. You can see all the rivers uh, coming into the model. We now have 101 rivers in the model. Um, the blue outline is GBR1, which I'll talk about a bit later. So the model extends past the uh, Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Area, um, and um, but all the areas within the model is e are as equally accurate as, um, as in the middle of the model or on the outside boundaries. Next slide. So this is uh, what we call river, um, a river footprint, or we put a die in the rivers of the Great Barrier Reef. So you can see the extent of the rivers. And then we've put it, say, in this case, we put a different colour for each different river. And you can see how they cross over each other. And the darker colours are where the river is more than 10% of that particular part of the ocean. And the lighter colours that you can see are where the, uh, the rivers are, are more than 1% of the um the grid cell within the ocean. So uh, river footprints are one of the biggest uh, components that we use in terms of determining water quality targets um, and determining uh, where they go and um, um, where they uh, put their sediment and their nutrients and pesticides. Um, next slide, thanks. Oh. All right. So this shows what goes on uh, for integration of, land, of the land and catchment with the global atmosphere and ocean to form a picture of how um, the coastal ocean responds. And as you can see, you can see the flow coming down the catchment and dispersing into the marine environment. And this is real time flow. This isn't just made up sort of animation of what the flow is. So this is actual flow that has, that is given to us at the mouth of the catchment. And so we use the Queensland uh, DES source models, which include paddock and catchment models, uh, both of which are validated with observations. And the catchment model gives us loads at the entrance of all the rivers entering into the marine model. We then use the Bureau of Meteorology flow for each of those rivers that you saw pulsing through the catchment to push loads into the marine model with freshwater flow. Uh, this is how we include nutrients, pesticide and sediment loads into the marine model at the entrance of each of these rivers. And we use this for the we use these for the GBR report card to report on chlorophyll and TSS once it gets out into the uh, marine ocean. 
Uh, next slide, please. Um, so just a short description of the Aries Marine model. So the middle and right hand side show the four kilometre and one kilometre resolution showing the bathymetry and the dark purple is 4,000 metres deep. So the four kilometre model is used for reporting the marine water quality for the GBR report cards and we've been doing this since 2016. And you can, so you can see the models um, two and a half thousand kilometres from Papua New Guinea where we include the Fly River in Papua New Guinea to the Queensland New South Wales border and we can include all the rivers um, down from Moreton Bay and um, down to the New South Wales border. As I said, it's three dimensional and it goes from um, zero to 4,000 metres deep. And it also has wetting and drying cells if there's um, tidal impacts close to the coast. There are 47 depth layers, uh, which you can see in the bottom right hand figure where there's finer resolution in the top layers to give that better definition to the close to the coast and you know what's happening in the top um, layers which are important due to sunlight and chlorophyll. Um, if you look at the small figure on um, bottom right you can see that lower resolution in the layers once you get to say 500 metres to 4,000 metres deep. So you don't need that in fine uh, definition. Next please. Um, this is the marine model. Um, there are lots of variables um, and it's complicated, um, but just in brief, in the orange writing, you can see um, all the components which use what we use. Um, it's called an optical model. And this allows us to, um, one of the things it does is it allows us to compare with satellite observed data for phytoplankton, chlorophyll and sediment. So we're looking at the spectral um, reflectances um, and we can compare this directly with what's coming out of the satellites, what the satellites observe. And the red boxes um, over the top, uh, they outline all the observations that we can use um, that we have in the model. So you can see we have um, a lot of phytoplankton, zooplankton, coral, obviously the model has coral, seagrass and macroalgae in it as well. Uh, next. Uh, so these, um, all these require um, diverse observations. Um, yeah, so, and we get these from IMOS, uh, Reef Authority, Ames, JD, JCU and Gadagil Sea Country, and also um, climatologies, um, various moorings, long-term monitoring sites, um, gliders and ships of opportunity that um, go up and down the coast that um, monitor uh, certain variables. Um, for the uh, physical model, we actually compile a lot of the observations into super obs. So in order to get the best representation of the observations, and we're hoping to do that in the next round of ERIS with the um, biogeochemical observations as well. The um, physical model has a lot more observations to use. So from Argo, XBTs, satellite altimetry and satellite and sea surface temperature. Um, we also integrate uh, observe plankton in with model currency and we do this for say zooplankton where we turn observations into model currency or models into observational currency and that's what we're required to do quite a bit with the different sorts of observations that are um, undertaken. Um, we also use sensor networks which have fluorometers and turbidity sensors. Um, fluorometers measure um, are a measure of, can be a measure of chlorophyll. And we also use the Gadagil Sea Ranger program, uh, coral and water quality monitoring sites. Next, please. Um, so for the BGC observations, um, we use over nine, we've used over 9,000 observations throughout the area and you can see some of the water quality um, or uh, many of the water quality sites that we use. You can see there's a um, bias towards lots of water quality sites near the coast and uh, there are fewer further out, which is why we use um, climatology and the physics of the model. So the XBTs and the Argo satellites, um, Argo and satellites further out. And in 2011 to 2023, we can compare chlorophyll nutrients, pesticides and suspended sediments in all of these that come out of the uh, catchment model. And yeah, I've mentioned the monitoring site programs that we use for all of these. As I said, for the BGC, we've got 8,000 and these are sort of like bottle observations. Obviously we've got hundreds of thousands of remote sensing 
observations that we also use, and all of these are very important. Uh, next, please. Um, so takeaways from the observations and model comparisons. So there's um, between two, um, 2010 and 2024, there have been a lot of spatial and temporal differences. Sometimes monitoring sites uh, stopped for a while. Sometimes they're restarted. Sometimes they're moved. Sometimes the depth layers are moved. So when we compare the model, um, if a bottle is taken at uh, 25 metres, we will take we will sample the model at 25 metres at that exact time that the bottle sample was taken, and and that's how we compare it. So it's a we use a very harsh, very raw comparison um, to the model in order to get it right. Um, and sometimes monitoring sites move, so we have to look in a slightly different spot for the uh, monitoring. Uh, for the variable subset, um, not all variables are observed, and so we need that conversion. I was saying, say, for example, for zooplankton. Um, sampling techniques, there are multiple types of observations for similar variables. Um, for example, um, chlorophyll, um, you can have bottled chlorophyll, we get a sample at a particular depth and we use a fluorometer to analyse it, or you can use a uh, um, HPLC, which, is an, which you can get much more defined pigments from and much more accurate determination of chlorophyll A. You can also use um, fluorometers to measure chlorophyll, and then you can use a depth average surface chlorophyll, which is a snake, which is a tube, which you can take from zero to 12 metres to look at an integrated sample. And you have to bring all those observations into the model in order to compare them, and you compare them in different ways. And they've all got their strengths, and um, there's no problem. Um, we, we just have to work out a way in which to integrate um, the model back into the observations and the observations into the model. Next slide, please. Um, so this um, is an example of um, how we use the optical model. Um, so in the top left, you can see a satellite observation using true, what's called true colour to look at the coast. And in the bottom, we can use the model um, to look at the uh, constituents of the model in exactly the same way. So, but we don't have, we have the benefit of having um, cloud free areas. We, so this is important during periods uh, when cyclones go over and there's so much cloud cover that you can't see what's going on in the water column. On the right hand side, you can see the resuspension of um, of the uh, sediment um, that's coming out of the rivers and also so the river sediment is a brown colour and the um, the uh, the uh, the white sand is reflecting light in the shallow reefs and lagoons. So the yellow sediment is the resuspension, and the resuspension is due to waves and hydrodynamics. And then you can also see the green of the river plumes going up along the coast as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, to go back to the last slide on case talk, and this is how we can integrate and use observations for looking at sensitive sites and the effect of land constituents on these sites. So this is just an example. So we looked at the surface area of observed matched seagrass habitat within the pesticide um, diuron plume. Diuron's uh, one of the most um, highly used uh, pesticides that turn up, turns up in the marine environment. Um, so up to 175 square kilometres of seagrass habitat can exceed the most stringent recommended diuron thresholds and up to 25 square kilometres of seagrass habitat throughout the entire GBR can exceed the less stringent diuron thresholds. So you can also see the pink 5% of seagrass um, habitat horizontal line and this represents 5% of all mapped seagrass throughout the entire GBR including deep seagrass beds. And I don't know whether you can see on the bottom, it goes from 2016 to um, mid-2018 along the bottom. And so this is when, um, so this is just showing when the diuron peaks at each uh, of, that, of those periods. Obviously, the seagrass most affected will be the inshore habitats. So although um, it's only 5% um, of all seagrass in the GBR, the inshore seagrasses are the most vulnerable and the most visible to the public. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you, I'll sum, summarise this briefly because it looks like we're running out of time. Um, so the uh, model and observations are also used for integration into management decisions, and these are just three of the ones uh, chosen here. So it's used for the GBR water quality report card where we use 
the data assimilation, so the remote sensing observations integrated in with the marine model and uh, where they basically um, learn from each other to get the best estimate of chlorophyll A, um, the water quality uh, scenarios and target scenarios. So the model is very good for running different sorts of load and um, catchments and where which catchments to do catchment repair and restoration. So we can look at the river plumes, where the river goes and see which rivers we can do something about in terms of catchment repair and restoration. And um, also we have reviewed monitoring programs. So we use the model, model to designate the best monitoring site locations. So you can uh, pick a particular site and you can see which rivers are running through that site throughout the depth of the water column. And um, sometimes rivers further to the south have a greater influence. Um, in that spiky diagram, you can see that the Burdekin in yellow um, has uh, as much influence on a site 300 kilometres to the north than the nearby rivers. So, uh, so you can use the model to determine if that's a good place for your site, if you want to look at all the rivers, or if you just want to look at one river, you, put, you can put the uh, site in a different place. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, yeah, uh, modelling and observations, the foundation of the decision support system and of policy and of management. And uh, we're uh, particularly in area six, as we move from area six, which comes from July this year to um, 2029, we're trying to improve uh, the integration of observations and modelling in the BGC side of things um, through feedback loops, because you increase trust by integrating observations and modelling in what's being produced. Um, and often, and we want more integration of the atmosphere and catchment, um, different types of Escapes, so the ocean, atmosphere and land, um, and um, to form a picture of how this um, coast, the coastal ocean responds and the coastal ocean, not just be, being the, the ocean closest to the coast, but also out into the broader reef environment. Um, and this uh, will lead to better scientific understanding and trust. And obviously there are lots of people involved. These are the DES um, paddock, uh, the catchment modelers and also the um, E-Reefs um, marine modellers that have been involved in this. Um, uh, a lot of the marine modellers there are um, in, uh, from Hobart. So um, yeah, uh, and all the catchment and paddock modellers are from DES in Queensland. And up the top is just showing you the, um, a new form of unstructured model grid that we have um, running at CSIRO, which can show the currents going through the reef and you can actually see the currents moving through um, the different coral reefs and um, through in between the reefs in the outer reefs. And that's it. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jenny, Mel, and Kay. Um, oh, I hope that's coming through. Thank you so much for that great talk and so much information. And I think, you know, the full appreciation of how much data is collected and then used and made publicly available. Um, I think every time I hear you speak, I get more appreciation of just how much information there is, but also how many humans it takes to make the magic happen. And so that partnership that we've been talking through these seminars really comes through. Um, as well as integration, I think integration, how do we integrate information and also resilience? How when we talk about resilience, what do we mean? So I think that was so informative. Thank you so much. Emma, I'll get you to stop the recording, please, and then we can go into our questions and answers. <laughs>